Yo, 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 Billy Joe. It's time to rock and roll. Scotch game style. This is an addition to our chess openings playlist. If you haven't watched all of them, then what else are you doing with your life? I'd like to know because it probably is more fun than making chess videos and watching them all day long. Any Hooters, let's talk about the Scotch game, which is one of White's most aggressive ways to challenge the center. A much more direct approach to the opening, the first stage of the game, than the Spanish, the Rui Lopez, which of course we have uh, opening lecture videos on the Spanish in our chess openings playlist. And of course there's the Four Knights, which we also covered, as well as the Italian game, which I do not believe we have covered yet, but will. The Scotch is, is actually my opening, so I looked at our playlist and realized that we don't even have a video lecture on my particular repertoire, which I guess is a uh, it's blast for me. So I said, no more. No more shall we ignore the obvious, which is that the Scotch game is the best way for White to play E4. That's right, I said it. Just go ahead and try to prove me wrong. Anyway, the thing about the Scotch that's most exciting is that it puts more pressure on your opponent. It's not it's not as studied deeply as the Spanish or as well known at the beginner level as like the Italian game or the fried liver attacks and the Gioco pianos. It's it's but it's a very solid way for White to play. Favorite of Kasparov in the late 80s and it, all through the uh, early to mid 90s. And after Black's best approach, which is of course to take the pawn, White captures back. And Black has a few different ways to approach it. The first and most common is probably the most principled, which is the classical. The move bishop to c5 simply brings another attacker to the dark squares in the center. And it makes a lot of sense because if your opponent, being white, is going to open the center that quickly, you want to make an effort to fight equally for those squares. After bishop to c5, white has two ways to approach the position. I can take on c6 or I can try to support. Taking on c6 essentially relieves the pressure in the center and sort of concedes victory to black in the sense that black will get more control over the dark squares. After the inner mizzo, queen to f6, black is threatening checkmate, and so white defends the pawn on f2, and after black takes back, we have sort of a, a very similar structure to a Rui Lopez or a Spanish exchange, which is that white has a positional edge on the king side, four pawns versus three, and will play for this sort of long-term advantage in the middle game and into the end game. But black has a small lead in development in compensation for it. Black does not have the bishop pair, but after knight to c3, bishop e6, we can see black's pieces coming into the center very easily with good control over the dark squares. The knight will develop in castles. And so because of that, white usually tries to do something directly to challenge it. This move knight a4 is an interesting approach for white. I suggest those who know the opening well enough to study it, you look into this move. And uh, after knight e7, white will sometimes relieve the pressure because being behind a development as I highlighted with a move like queen f4 offering the end game or offering a ton of fun with some pawn grabbing, pawn grabbing stuff, right? Don't go grabbing my pawn. I think I think that makes sense. Knight takes c6 is a line that I've probably played more often than not, but bishop to e3 is perhaps the more principled approach for white to continue to increase control over the center instead of relieving the pressure. And after queen f6, white usually plays c3. The line with knight d to b5, the Blumenfeld Gambit, is an exciting one. And again, if you're out there and you're actually a Scotch game player, you can look into that as a fun weapon to have, especially in blitz and rapid chess. But after c3 and knight to e7, white has two main approaches, either bishop to c4 to prevent d5, get castled, and, and take the approach that Kasparov and even more recently Magnus Carlsen have played when playing the Scotch. Or you can even play the g3 variation, where the bishop tries to take a more positional approach long term the bishop likes this diagonal but the risk behind this move is that black can challenge with d5 strike very early in the center a move that bishop to c4 prevents so again you can look into all those variations if you wish to do so a more recent try for white rather than knight takes c6 and bishop e3 is this interesting move knight to b3 which voluntarily moves the piece twice in the opening but white has an idea of developing the queen side rather quickly the bishop either coming to e3 or to g5 and even casting long again it's an interesting variation for white that if you are really considering making the scotch game a part of your repertoire i would recommend looking into that the sharpest approach for black is the mysis variation which rather than the classical knight f6 puts pressure on e4 and sort of punishes white's direct approach of opening the center a different way if black has his way he will continue to develop his pieces with tempi all surrounding the e4 pawn by putting pressure due to the pin. Because of that, black doesn't, white doesn't want to play knight c3 and allow bishop b4, which is perfectly playable, by the way, and would be a transposition into sort of a four-knight scotch game. But the most accurate way for white to approach the position is to take on c6 now, and after b takes c6, 
Noted should be that D takes C6 is absolutely horrific because after trading queens, we head to an endgame where white has the positional advantage of the four on three, but black doesn't have a development lead or anything really to show for it. In fact, if anything, he's he's worse when it comes to development and king safety in addition to being worse positionally. So D takes C6 doesn't work. But after B takes C6, E5, queen E7, queen E2... This variation is one of the sharpest in the scotch. It's one where white overextends in the center in order to gain space, but gives black targets for the rest of the game, being these e5 and c4 pawns. Both bishop a6 and knight to b6 are main moves here for black, if you want to look into that. Another interesting try for white, though I don't believe it leads to anything more than equality, is this move bishop to d3 instead of e5, and after d5, e5, knight g4, we get some sharp positions that occur all centered around the e5 pawn, which is one of the common things about the Mises. Black going out of his way to try to win this pawn, even with aggressive moves like g5, but white having sort of long-term compensation against black's weakened and overextended structure for the rest of the game. So again, if we're looking at the scotch game, we see that black's two main options, bishop to c5 and knight to f6, were covered here, the classical and the Mises variation, giving you the best general knowledge I can about the structure as well as the development patterns. The third variation for black that is a sideline, though definitely a possibility, is the Steinitz variation with queen to h4, which again, like knight f6, is a different way of punishing white for being overly aggressive in the center. I'm attacking the e4 pawn, and if you want to just defend it, I will continue to increase my pressure, taking advantage of this. Sort of annoying when you look at the fact that white doesn't have an easy way to defend the pawn. This guy is pinned. Bishop to d3 would block the, the queen's protection of the knight. So often we get very sharp variations where white tries to flip the script, a.k.a. gangster rap style, and take advantage of black, leaving his queen side behind. Says, all right, well, I can't successfully defend the e4 pawn, but we'll see if you end up being happy that you took this e4 pawn in a few moves once you have to defend this pawn and are now struggling with uh, lack of development and giving me compensation for the rest of the game. So this is White's best approach, is this move knight c3, followed by knight d to b5. I guess the final fourth variation I should mention, because even though it's a sideline, is very solid, is the move bishop b4 check. The main difference between this move and the classical is that if I can induce the move c3 and only then go back to c5, now in these variations, after bishop e3, bishop b6, I don't have to waste the move queen f6 to induce c3, aka attack the knight to get you to play this weird move, because I've already induced this pawn to move forward, which could give me some development advantages when your knight doesn't get the most active square and I haven't taken away my active square from my knight. Giving the best general idea behind bishop before check is what I've done there even though obviously the theory is certainly more complicated than that. But I hope you enjoyed this wild ride, fast-paced and furious as all the chess openings are. This is designed as an introduction to help kickstart you in your own opening repertoire and maybe even learn enough to play in tournaments someday. Who knows, right? Dream big. Way to go, kids. I'll see you around on the main site.